I, I want to, before I get in my message, I want to talk a little politically if I can for just a minute. Uh, I have asked, many people have asked me in the state of Louisiana, they said, Jesse, you ought to run for this, run for that. I, I said, I'm not called to do that, but I'm called to be a voter. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, people ask me all over the world, and I have preached in more churches than most people have ever been to. Me and Jerry probably, well, Jerry, three or 4,000 different churches all over the world. And, and, and <laughs> I mean, constantly. And some of them I've been preaching for 35 and 37 years every year, preaching now to their great, their great grandchildren. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Well, to make a long story short, you might have seen this program. I was on uh, TBN. Most of the time, I'm a host. I love the host, and, uh, and I enjoy that. But uh, Matt and Laura Krause said, Jesse, we need you as a guest. I want you and Andrew Womack. I said, okay. So I walked in there, me and Andrew, and I, we had no idea what we were going to talk about. And, and Matt says, do you believe in grace? I said, well, I'm here. Didn't have grace in my life. I wouldn't be here. The devil would have killed me a long time ago. You saved by grace. And we just got to talking about that. And it was a wonderful program. You might have seen it. It was a few months back. And it was just such a blessing of the Lord. And, you know, and, and uh, several people there in the, uh, in, the, in the audience began to ask questions. What are you seeing out there? Let me tell you how to touch the world. I want you to listen to me. We fought a war in 1776. We declared independence from an empire that was the most powerful empire on the earth. That was Great Britain. Most of the battles that George Washington fought, he actually ran away from because he didn't have the ability to win them simply because the states would not support the Continental Army. Don't you listen to this for a minute. I'm going to pull this over into, into the Christian world. George Washington was a phenomenal man. But you got to understand something. The only footprint America could understand at that time was the footprint of Europe. What they wanted was free and independent states. Nobody called themselves Americans. There were 750,000 people in Virginia. They, the first five presidents were Virginians. They called themselves Virginians. Thomas Jefferson called himself a Virginian. Think about that. Now, so was George Washington. He was from Virginia. But see, there was four men that God designed to see, to make this nation what it is. And that was George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, who wrote the Federalist Papers, James Madison, who wrote the Constitution of the United States, and John Jay, the first, first Supreme Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the first one. These four men understood what God wanted to do with this nation. The others did not because we were under a, 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 a thing called the Articles of Confederation. And in the Articles of Confederation, if you studied history and things of that nature, it said that we, we became free and independent states. So in 1776, we declared independence, but we had to fight a war because you see, freedom is not free. And George Washington, brilliant as he was, and he was the most wealthiest president we've ever had, even till today, George Washington. He married a very rich woman. <laughs> Behind every great man is a woman rolling her eyes. <laughs> and I don't doubt Martha did the same thing. But anyway, praise God. If you understand him, he had a, a, what I call a revelation from God. And God gave it to those other four. Alexander Hamilton was the first secretary treasurer of the United States. John Jay was the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. And James Madison was the fourth president of the United States. To make a long story short, these four men understood what God wanted to do with this nation. No one else did. Because in the Articles of Confederation, they would be free and independent states. So I don't know how many times that George Washington had said, listen, I can't fight a war of this magnitude without some finance to handle this thing. Because there were men with no shoes. Valley Forge, they were, they were freezing. I mean, it, and what happened is nobody wanted to pay the bill. But God gave those four men to understand what we call the federal government. So what James Madison is called the father of the Constitution, they call the Constitution a living document. Now, the Lord told me to say this and so I, I, under his direction, otherwise I wouldn't. And James Madison, when he had the preamble wrote, he was supposed to say this, we the people of a free and independent states. He said, change that. 
And they said this, we the people of the United States of America. Remember, nobody called themselves the Americans. Even John Adams called himself a Bostonian. Thomas Jefferson, a Virginian. But when that constitution came out, it made us form what God wanted, a nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, not free independent states. Now let's get to the God part. How do you touch the world for the Lord Jesus Christ? On that program, Matt Krause said, what camp are you in, Brother Jesse? And some of you may have seen that. And I looked at him and I said, Matt, I have to rephrase your question. There's only one camp of God, but there's many different tents. Just like there's the nation of Israel back then, but there was 12 different tribes. If we're going to touch the world, we're not going to do it by coming together on the same doctrine. There's some people don't believe in the rapture, so let them stay here. <laughs> They're going to wish to God they'd have gone. They're going to have to die for Jesus Christ if they stay. There's some never going to believe in speaking in tongues. There is no use to try it. But they are of one flock. And I would say this to every denomination, non-denomination and interdenomination that calls themselves a Christian, that we need to see Christianity the way God showed George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison, this nation, one nation, not free and independent states. So you can still be a Baptist and a Methodist and an Episcopalian, a Presbyterian, a Church of God, a Church of Christ, a Word of Faith, a full gospel, a Sims of God, a United Pentecostal, Amish, Mennonite, whatever. But if we'll come together in the unity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you see, and we hold that banner up because you're not going to get everybody to believe the same. But we all believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Believe if you're a Christian, we could touch the world in a day. But what has happened is, is that Satan has made us free and independent churches. Until we come together under this united effort that Jesus Christ is Lord everywhere, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic. I mean, when Brother Copeland went to see Pope Francis, I had more preachers eating my lunch. Well, is Kenneth going Catholic? I said, why don't you call KCM and ask him? But my God, man, man believe in Jesus. I ain't saying we believe everything the same. That's not the issue. But you see, all these other people fought and it took so long. That's why it took George Washington so long to win these battles. God had to just intervene because he didn't have the money to help the governments. He didn't have the money to help the army. But they created a, a federal government. And then one of the Virginians gave us our Bill of Rights. And one of them is the Second Amendment. And it's a wonderful thing because you see the right to bear arms is not to protect you from criminals or thieves. It's to protect you from the government. And if you don't believe that, just go read it to protect you from the government so that you wouldn't be controlled like it was before we declared independence. Now, I'm not trying to put political in that point, but I'm saying is this, if we'll stay, if the United States will stay united and if the churches will come together united, even Jesus said that. He was talking to the disciples. He's talking about the Jewish and he said, there's other people that I will call to my name, which was us, the Gentiles. And there was a missed interpretation of the word foal. He said, it all shall be one foal. He said, he said, I came to this foal, which was the Jewish people. He said, but there's others that will come that will be one foal. If you look at that in the original, one foal it meant one flock. We may have different foals in Christianity, but there's only one flock. We may have many different tents, but there's only one camp. So, you know, God has given me the honor of preaching Catholic churches, Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, Assembly God churches, Word of Faith churches. I've preached to the Amish. I've preached to the Mennonites. 
Yeah. What did you do? I just preached Jesus. I preached in Jewish synagogues all over, everywhere. Why? To let my light shine because I believe that this church must be united so we can form a church of the people, by the people, for the people. You know, Abraham Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address, he was right on the date, but wasn't really right when he said four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought four. Really, that's not true. Yeah, that's when it started, but they were free and independent states. So thank God that James Madison made them change the wording that we, the people of the United States, the preamble to the Constitution. Well, I want to tell everybody this. If we do this in all you different churches that call us up Jesus, that you call yourself a Christian, this Bible and this church don't need any amendments. It's actually not only a living document, but a completely perfect document. Amen. See what I'm saying? So receive that. So you pastors, when you go out, talk to the Catholic priests and talk to the Methodists and say, you don't have to be what I am in terms of a Baptist or a Pentecostal, but we must come together because this nation needs it. Because we got the answer to stopping people from killing people in Chicago like crazy. There is slaughter going on in Chicago. Children can't even play outside. They get shot. I'm talking six years old, five years old. It's almost in every, st- every city. It's terrible. But if this church, the Christian church, Without trying to fight what? Then we don't want to be Sadducees and Pharisees. I don't believe in the the resurrection. Forget all that. Stay dead if you don't believe in it. (laughs) That's not the issue. But come together under the banner of Christianity. And you know what? We'll change the world. I'm Jesse Duplantis and I approve this message. Okay. I said what the Lord told me to say. Praise the Lord. If you got your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 18? The book of Matthew chapter 18. Once again, I was in my study and the spirit of the, I was talking to the Lord about different things and I actually talked to the Lord a lot about financial things and investments and talked to him about gifts of the spirit and operations and I just have conversations as well as a reading and studying of the Word of God. I'm a man that loves information. I have a very lucrative library. People that come to my home, they can't get over my library, especially ministers. And uh, it's truly amazing. And my right, Fritz Brown, my uh, my oldest employee here, he said, my God, Brother Jesse, my, you know, your house is beautiful, but if you you go by the way of the grave, whoever gets your library, Lord Jesus. And it's full of every kind of subject because I like being informed. I like to talk intelligently about something. And if you don't know much about the Jehovah Witness doctrine, how are you going to talk intelligently about a Jehovah Witness or to a Jehovah Witness? So, you know, I read things I may not believe. They don't infect me so I can intelligently talk and form a case. And I've had several people say, you could be a lawyer. You could litigate something. I said, well, no, I just love information. I want to know so we can speak intelligently and revelation wise concerning things. Well, I was in my uh, study and I was just saying, Lord. And he said, what? I said, you said in Matthew chapter 18, and the Lord always does this to me. He said, what did I say, Jesse? <laughs> tell me what I said. He loves me to tell him what he says. You know what I'm saying? Tell me what I said. And I said, you said that if two, in Matthew 18, I believe 19, you said, if two of you on earth agree as touching, and before I could finish, he said, I'll be you too. I said, what? He said, I'll be you too. He said, Jesse, you don't need to look for another person. I'll be you too. How many of you believe in God for something? I'll be you too. You ain't got to look any further. I'll be you too, man. My God, if two of us believe, we can get anything you believe. I want to talk about that tonight. I'll be you too. Now think about if your whole church became a bunch of twos, we'd be a bunch of tutus. Because all you got to do is get somebody to agree, but not only agree, touch. See, some ministers think that when they receive an offering into their ministry, they go, oh, glory to God. They go, well, you know, and they go on to the next thing. They don't realize that that now you're taking on responsibility of what that person that sold into your ministry and into your life 
their belief or their dream. And you have to keep your, yourself holy and clean so that they can receive what they believe in, just like that you received what they gave you. And I want to deal with that tonight. And when the Lord told me, he said, I'll be you too. I said, my God, man, because I'm known for statements. God gives me statements. I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. All my meetings, he said, but just cost you something. Vision, bring you something. Which one you want to deal with? I said, I'll deal with the vision. He said, good. See, I always deal with the vision because the budget's going to come to play. That's why I was talking about BVOV early, because you see, that's where you touch the world and you get things done quickly. So when he said, I'll be you too, I just got to shout it. So I walked in the, I think Kathy was in the kitchen, which was a miracle of God to start with that, be in the kitchen. I'm sorry, God. We have a beautiful kitchen. They don't use, we don't use it, but we got a beautiful kitchen. No, I'm just, I give her a hard time. She can cook good. Memories, but anyway, basically. And I walked in, I said, Kathy. She goes, what? I'll be you too. She said, two what? I said, if two of us on earth agree, God just told me he'd be my two. How many of y'all believing for something? Come on. How many of y'all out there believe for something? I'll be you too. You don't need to look for another person. But it would be nice to get a bunch of twos. So I want to deal with that. Now we're going to start in the King James Version, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start with verse 18. Now there's something really unique about this verse. Jesus talking. How many of y'all believe the word of God? You believe what Jesus said. Let's see, what, if, see if you do. Verse 18 says, Verily I say unto you, that whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that you have power in two dimensions. You have power on the earth to bind, and you have power in heaven to bind. In other words, you can bind something here and an angel of God, a serpent, a cherubim, an archangel, and if it's bound in heaven, they can't loosen it until you do. Because you have power in two dimensions. Think about that. Here and there. Do you understand that? And when, it, when, it's, when it's bound, no one can loosen it unless you loosen it. That tells you that you ought to know something about heaven or the universe because you have power there. You're the only species that he gave that power to. Everyone else is servants. You are sons that serve. Do you see that? Let me read that again. He said, just as Jesus talking, he says, Very I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he says in verse 19, again, I say unto you, see, because he had to say it again, because you don't get it the first time. So Jesus said, again, I say unto you. So he said this before verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching. The word touching is the most important part because now you're getting involved in someone's dream, in someone's belief. And that means a lot to God. It means a lot to the person that you're agreeing with. Now watch this. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching. How many things? 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 So I don't care what the church world says, what it only spiritual. No, anything is spiritual, physical, and financial. What part of that you don't understand? Because he said anything. Did he say anything? Don't look at me, look at the scripture. Did he say anything? Did he say that? I'll be you too. So it's not greed to believe God for finances. Because finances is anything. It's not greed to believe for a husband. Or a wife, because I say anything. I see so many people missing each other. I see so many young, beautiful women said, if I could just find a glorious man, a man that loves God and got a little money. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. It's in anything. And yet they can't seem to find, and I see them all over the place. I see young ladies looking. I see young men looking, you know. In fact, a man asked me, how many women you think are in the world? Now, I know he had a little lust on his mind. You can see it. How many, men, how many women you think are in the world? I said, I know exactly how many women are in the world. You do? I said, yeah, one. Her. That's it. That's all I see right there. One. Did you like that, Kathy? Did you like that? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I had to repent for the last thing I said. I just want to make sure that. Again, I say, I got to read it again. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. 
Now you got to get involved and ask it. Not it might be, not this, if it be his will, no! When are we going to take God at God's word verbatim, exactly the way he said it? If you should ask anything, it shall be done. Watch this. For them are my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three, uh oh, now we've just been introduced to a three. I'll be you two, now that we got a three. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, oh, what name? The name of Jesus. There am I in the midst of them. Now, let, let me take you back in time. Let's go way back. Before this planet was created, before you were created. Some people don't believe in the triune God, but it's true. How do I know that? Because I'm made in his image. I'm a spirit housed in a soul and clothed in a body. So I am a triune being myself. Amen. God the Father, who is number one, because everything Jesus did, he came that I might, you might know the Father. Everything he does is to please the Father. The Father had a business meeting, for lack of a better way to say it. And most people think Jesus died 2,000 years ago in Golgotha, and that's not true. That's his physical death. The Bible said he was a lamb led to the slaughter before the foundations of the earth. You know where the scripture is. You can look and turn to it if you want. God the Father said something that was phenomenal. He had a business meeting. Number one, he said, you know, I want to create a species. And number two, Jesus, number three, Holy Ghost said, okay. And I'm going to create a species like I've never created before. What are all these species that you see in the scripture? The wheel within the wheel. That creature with all the eyes, the seraphims, the cherubims, the archangels. I mean, my God, God's got a vivid mind of creation. He's still creating. Right now, the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. The speed of light can't catch it. Think about that. At 186,000 miles a second, it can't catch it. Watch this. He said, I want to create a species and I'm going to give them my power. Oh, I'm going to give them dominion over all the works of my hand. What does that mean? Seraphims, cherubims, archangels, the wheel within the wheel, the creatures, the different things that God through this universe. Now we believe in there's such thing as multiple universes. I can understand that with God. But they're going to mess up. They're going to mess up. They're going to disappoint me. And they're going to sin. And I need someone to help them. And Jesus said, eh, I be you too. <laughs> this is for any of us here. I be you too. I'll take on flesh what you create. I will call myself the son of man and I'll let you call me the son of God. And I'll get them back. And sure enough, we know the story of Jesus Christ. He was the two boy. I mean, he said, I came that you might know the father. I only say what my father says. I only do what my father says to do. Watch it. So something is happening here. That's why Satan hates you because you were created on a higher order, on a higher creation than him. That's why you have dominion over him. That's why he would not bow down to Adam. I will not bow. Yes, you will. See, so more, more people love the first Adam more than they like the second Adam. But watch what Jesus did. He said, I'll be you too. So we know about the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus ascended into heaven, do you know it's possible to be captive in paradise? It's very possible you to be in captivity right in the blessing of God. A lot of people don't even realize that. Well, I mean, my God, you can be going to the most Bible-believing church, sitting in there with the fullness of the Holy Ghost and still be in captivity. Jesus had to go to paradise to set the captive free. You would think it'd be pretty good, brother, on Abraham bosom, right? They were in captivity. How many people have I seen, Jerry, how many you have seen in churches that are in captivity? And we're sent to set the captive free to do the work of number two, Jesus. But when Jesus ascended, we lost our two. And the Holy Ghost said, uh, I'm changing my number. I'll be the two. Amen. So now the Holy Spirit is the two. And you got to understand it this way, that the heart of God, look at me, the heart of God is the Father. The face of God is the Son, Jesus Christ. 
The voice of God is the Holy Ghost. But the hands of God is the church. Number one, number two, number three, and me and you, number four. Do you see that? You have a number. Jesus was the first begotten of the dead. What number are you? You have a number. Do you understand that? So when Jesus ascended, Holy Ghost said, we need a two. Someone to believe with us. And to only, what's it? Does the same thing Jesus, I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do exactly the same thing. So when you understand that, I'll be your two. I don't care what you believe in for. All you need is one, and God is, you already got that with God, but it's good to get another and get a whole church believing in two. Well, my whole church, Kathy, uh, built the church called Covenant Church. Everybody's twos. Why? We need to develop that in every area. So not long ago, I was, I was outside, and the Methodist minister walked by, and he said, you Reverend Justin the plant. I said, yes, I am. He said, I'm the Methodist pastor. I said, how you doing? I said, how things are going? He said, well, you know, we believe in for some things. I said, I'll be you too. He said, two what? I said, it's two on earth. Come on, give me my hand. Give me your hand. I'll touch you. I'll believe God with you, man. I can do that. He said, but you're not Methodist. I said, do Methodists believe in Jesus? He said, yes. I said, I'm a Methodist. How you doing? <laughs> I believe one camp. That's right. I'm not going to be a free, independent Christian. I'm going to be a united Christian that call anybody that calls themselves that Jesus is Lord of their life. You see what I'm saying? So write this down if you're taking notes. When you understand this method, what method? If two of you on earth is agree is touching, what happens? Doubt loses its power. Number one, write it down. Doubt loses its power and your soul enlarges its, its capacity. When doubt is no longer a part of your life, it's amazing what will come in your life. Remember years ago, if you learn to doubt your doubts, you won't be a doubt no more because your doubts have been doubted because you learned to doubt your doubts. That the only thing the devil got is doubt. So when the devil throws doubt in your mind, say, devil, I doubt that. And the devil said, you can't doubt that. I'm the one with the doubt. Yeah, but I doubt your doubt. No, no, I'm the one with the doubt. Yeah, but I doubt it. <laughs> now, the devil gets easily confused because he's the author of confusion. <laughs> he don't know what to do because he's decaying. He's not as smart today as he was yesterday. He's on the limits of retardation. Did you understand that? <laughs> you got to be a complete idiot to think you're going to win a battle against God. See, so all of a sudden devils start talking to each other. Listen, I put doubt in the man's mind, he doubted. What did you say? I put doubt in his mind and he doubted. You mean to tell me you put doubt in his mind and he doubted? That's exactly what he did. What should I do? I don't know. I doubt it myself. He's the only one who seemed to know what's going on. Ask him. <laughs> Let me slow down. If you learn to doubt your doubts, you won't be a doubter anymore. Your doubts have been doubted because you've learned to doubt your doubts. <laughs> so when God gives me something unbelievable and impossible, I hear another word coming in, doable. So when he told me, he said, Jesse, believe me, from, for that Falcon 7X, I said, okay, Lord, he said, I need you too. I said, glory to God, glory to God, my God. And I went to a church in Sacramento, Bill calls, he's around here somewhere. He said, Jesse, I need you too. People just became my twos. We're a bunch of tutus. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost is a two. Remember, you bind something in heaven, an angel can't loosen it. If your mama's in heaven, she can't loosen it. You're the only one who can do that because you're working in two different th dimensions. When you understand that, and, and Satan is the prince of the power of the air. That's why he hates television. We have to go through his living room to preach the gospel. <laughs> he hears more religion than he hears us preaching more than anybody else. You know, he buys a lot of my tapes. I call it tape CDs and stuff. I had a lady one time, she ran horses. She ordered, five, remember that, $5,000, that's way back when, and bought the whole series. And she played them for her horses. In the stars. God is my, I said, are you serious? She said, run better. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the dogs ran for oral and the horses are running for me, praise God. Am I telling the truth? You, you filled the order. Them horses don't doubt. <laughs> they just run. See, doubt loses its power and your soul is enlarged, is, is, it enlarges because of its capacity to receive what God is saying. I'll be you too. So everything I'm believing for right now, I cannot do. 
And if you believe for something you can't do, that you can do, you're not walking by faith. You got to get out to go where no man has gone before. You got to get out where no one can help you other than the Lord Jesus Christ because he's your first two. But more, if you got someone that's understanding you, say, I'll agree with you and I'll touch it with you, brother. Ooh, now I got two twos. And you get a whole church believing that, you'll get your church out of debt like that. You'll get everybody in your church out of debt like that. Why? Because agreement has great power. Listen, you can't express wants that you do not feel. Write that down. You can't express wants. I ain't talking about needs. You can't express wants that you do not feel. A want is way greater than a need. A want will move you more emotionally than a need will. Because see, a want will make you happy and a need will make you sad. But if you get what you want instead of what you need, you will destroy what you need because your want is way more powerful than your need. But you can't express a want that you do not feel. But just I want to I want to pray right. He who wants of God will always pray right. If two of you again, I said to you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching write this now, when you come together, something happens. One, one unity of spirit. Number two, unity of mind. And number three, unity of purpose. What does those three do? They produce agreement. They produce reaction. You understand? I want you to listen to me. I know what I'm talking about here. I'll be your two in every area. You see, when I go to a doctor, and I don't like doctors. I mean, I like doctors personally. I just don't like what they do. And they start telling me about what can happen bad. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't come here for a sermon. I just came here to see how good you are. Now, you, can you diagnose something? Well, you got to tell me your symptoms. I'm kind of like Nebuchadnezzar. I ain't telling you nothing. Tell me the dream. <laughs> Man, I never, forget, I never forget one time I went, Kathy wanted me to get a, a you know, build, you know, they just do things that I just don't like. Colonostomies. Look, God put it in the back. I ain't never seen it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about my colon. And they get so excited. You know how, how clean your colon is? No. <laughs> but I looked at him and I told, I looked at that doc, I never forget it, it was the Homer Medical and Surgical Clinic. I looked at him and the Holy Ghost came on me. I thought, oh, Jesus. I looked at him and said, how you doing, doc? He said, I'm doing fine. Make you sit on that paper. You know, you move. <laughs> you know, I hate that paper. I don't like that paper. I looked at him, I said, you're sick. He's got his, he got his glasses like this. What? I said, you need me more than I need you. You're sick. He just looked at me, I said, give me your hand, doc. He said, excuse me, I said, give me your hand. I'm a doctor too. He said, you are. I'm a doctor of divinity. I got it on the wall. I wasn't lying. I got it on the wall. I prayed when I grabbed him, boy. He didn't know what to do. When's the last time you prayed for your doctor? I said, Jesus, touch him and help him. Bless him. He goes, oh, he, he, he says, I'm Catholic. I said, that's okay. Jesus, touch him. He said, can I, can I make the sign of the cross? I said, yeah, use your other hand. Because <laughs> I had his hand. I ain't turning loose his hand. If two of you agree on earth, that's touch. Listen, God told me to pray for that man. I don't know that man. He know more about me. He's seen things about me I ain't never seen. <laughs> he asked me, he said, how's your prostate? I said, where is it? He told me, I said, it's fine. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say about that. Out of sight. I'm not, I know you need to get checked out. <laughs> I prayed for him. He forgot to do, what do you call it? Uh, uh, electrocardiogram? He had to go to the, he forgot because I shook him up. <laughs> so I went back the next day. I had to go back to, get, to finish this thing, you know. And I'm standing there and there are people standing everywhere. And the guy said, you ain't, you, uh, it's going to take a long time to get in there. I said, I don't think so. Well, it makes you say that. I said, I prayed for him yesterday. Pray for who? Pray for the doctor. 
you did? I said, yeah, I did. All of a sudden, the little lady slides the thing. She said, Reverend DePlantis, are you out there? Now, they've been in there an hour. I just got in there maybe two minutes. I said, yes. The doctor would like to speak to you. I looked at the man and said, you see? <laughs> I walked in. He said, Reverend, come here. Takes me out the room. Where they, they, come here. He said, you know what I did after you prayed for me? He said, I finished my practice and I went home. I've been wanting to eat red beans and rice for a long time. I couldn't eat my stomach. He said, I ate a whole plate of red beans and rice. I said, did you eat the sausage with you? He said, yeah. I said, cholesterol and all? He said, yeah. I said, how you feel? He said, good. He said, you know, I've never had, I've been practicing 40 years and I've never had anyone pray for me. I'll be you too. I said, Doc, the Lord sent me here and told me you were sick. He said, you know, I have, I have never felt this good in years. He said, I think I'm going to eat some more red beans and rice. I said, you need to lay off that sausage there a little bit there. <laughs> That's a true story. You see, doubt loses its power. I got together with God in unity of spirit, unity of mind, and unity of purpose, which produced agreement and reaction, and the man received this healing. See, when you understand that, you see, this should be happening all the time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you a question. What's the difference? Since we have power in two dimensions, I'll be you two. Come on. Since we got power in two, what's the difference between us here and the people in heaven? There's only one word that to describe it all. Discord. There's no discord in heaven. There's discord in here. Now, if you got the power to bind on earth and you got the power to bind in heaven, why are you having discord here? Disagreement. When God said, if two of you agree on earth as touching, anything there, anything. That's why people in heaven are not struggling because there's no discord. God the Father is not fighting God the Son and God the Son is not trying to help God the Holy Ghost. But your spirit is trying to, is trying to get your soul to get right so your body will get in effect. See, you, we're fighting each other. There's no discord. That's why you see in heaven, people say the laws of my show, but I shall not want. Everybody's got what they want. In my father's house are many mansions, spiritually, physically, financially. And there's an economy going on out there, my Lord. And the universe is our oyster. You understand what I'm saying? And God is doing so many wonderful things. But because there's no discord. You know, you see, you got to agree to disagree by being agreeable. I wish everybody spoke in tongues. Now I'm going to say something going to make people mad. I wish everybody was rich as me. I, I, I'm not bragging about that. I, it's just a fact. <laughs> Jane Robinson said to me, I sure wish I had Jesse money. <laughs> you said that a few years ago. I wish you were. I, I would love it. But you see, you think, oh, that, that, just, that just happens once in a while. Well, that would make God a respecter of person. So I disagree with you on that, but I do it agreeably. Now, you got to understand, it, I, I don't try to prove nothing to nobody. I live in a beautiful home, Lord Jesus, my God. And I'm telling you what, and, and, but I heard Kathy say, Jesse could live in a treehouse. I don't care. I'm not out to prove nothing to nobody in any way, shape, or form. I'm just going to please God. So I've had people say, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. I said, then you never will. I don't believe in healing. You hadn't got sick enough, but okay. I don't believe in that falling down stuff. All right. You see, I don't preach what's wrong. I preach what's right. If I preach enough right, the right will change the wrong. Do you understand? Yeah. I just preach what's right. At first, people, oh, you know, I just keep a smile. It's amazing what a smile will do. It's amazing when you just don't give up. You just keep believing that I'm a two. I mean, I, 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 a lot of time I do that if I'm in a restaurant. I said, so what are you going to do? I, well, I'm going to college and, and, and you know, I, I got I to gotta pay all these bills. I said, I'll be you too. You be to what? Well, I, I said, I'll agree with you. Oh, you will. Well, thank you. Let me pray here. Well, yeah, I've done it at funerals right at the casket. <laughs> I mean, I've had people say he looks good. No, he looked dead. He's dead. He don't look good. He's dead. For God's sake, man, quit being a fool. Don't start lying right in front of the dead corpse. He's dead. Uh, 
well, would you pray for me? I said, well, bow your head. Uh, uh, right here, but the guy in the coffin ain't going to hear us. <laughs> I just pray. Why? That sounds weird. No, because see, sometimes you need a two in a place you never thought you needed a two. Jesus said, if you agree on earth, watch this. He's given you power to bind things that, that are in a dimension that Satan cannot touch. One time I prayed for God to do something and the Lord and the Lord, the angel of the Lord said to God, I can't loose it unless he loosens it. Oh, this is good. Oh, and I thought, man, I, I got, why I'm made in his image. When I go to the throne of God, angels proclaim, one of the sons of God is coming before the father, El Shaddai, Elohim, and his name is Jesse. Man, them doors fly open. People say, that's arrogance. No, that's position. That's position. Because Jesus said that. So the reason why heaven is so different from the earth is because of discord. See these glasses? <laughs> they cost about 20 bucks. I think I bought them at a, uh, what do you call that, drugstore. A man criticized me the other day about this. He said, you know, you believe in healing, don't you? I said, yes, sir. Why you wear them glasses? I said, there's some things I don't want to see. <laughs> there's just some things I don't want to see, Bill, and one of them was him. He didn't know what to say. <laughs> There's just some things I just rather not discuss. I don't get in discard with people. I've had the media come and say, we heard you had a jet. I said, you heard wrong. I've had three of them. <laughs> oh, they just freak out. <laughs> well, you know, the Bible said, I said, now don't get on the Bible because you're going to look like an idiot. You're getting on my territory, man. Stay in the journalistic area. You get on the Bible, I'm going to eat your lunch. You don't even know what the Bible is. <laughs> Write this down. Never come to church without consideration. Why? Go read the scripture. Consider the apostle and high priest of your profession, Christ Jesus. What is the ideal church? Well, most people think it's the Lord's church. No. Most people think it's a middle-sized church. No. There's some people don't want a large church. Or they want to go to a small church and they like to know everybody's business. <laughs> Christians are nosy, Lord Jesus. <laughs> is that the ideal church? No. What is the ideal church? Let me show you. The Christ-like church. There are a lot of people in hell that went to church. There are a lot of people go to church that don't know nothing about the scripture. I love what Joel Osteen says, go to a Bible-believing church. I love that. The other day, Kathy said, Jesse, I want to show you something. And I don't know where she got this. And it was somebody, I don't know if they put it on Facebook. I don't know exactly what it was. And it was John Osteen preaching. Yeah. And brother, was he shucking corn. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, he kind of stand like that. I mean, he just preached. I said, man, John Osteen is Pentecostal, boy. He was just going at it. What a blessing. Yet I've had some people, and I love, I love the Osteen family. I know him very well. Well, you know, Joel's not like John. He ain't supposed to be. It's his son. That's right, that's right. See, because God the Father is totally different from God the Son. God the Son is totally different from God the Holy Ghost. Yet they're three in one. You figure it out. Because God the Father is still number one, and Jesus is number two, and the Holy Ghost number three. But here, he's number two. But they don't argue with each other. There's no discord. You never heard Jesus say, now, Father... Father, Father. <laughs> no. You, now, for y'all that don't know what that, that is, Brother Keith Moore was preaching on that this week. Oh, no, you don't hear that. But boy, that slap thing got my, rev I got a revelation. Because I say, Kathy, and she go, slap that down, I ain't doing that. We got in an argument not too long ago. We, every once in a while, we get in one. I look, I said, I'm going to tell you something. Did you call me a woman? <laughs> oh, I mean, she was, I mean, I mean, the fur was up, the claws was out. I ain't the same 
dumb, stupid girl you married 46 years ago. I said, I miss her. I liked her a lot. <laughs> she said, I got a revelation for you. She's dead. I said, what? She's dead. <laughs> I said, okay. I need some agreement here. I need to. Good. Good. Never go to church without consideration. The idea of church is the Christ-like church, not the Lord's church. What does I'll be your two means? Two words, Jerry. Presence and power. You got to have presence and you got to have power. That's what a two does. You come with your presence because you're touching and believing with this person and then power to produce what they believe in God for. You hear what I'm saying? And when the Lord just interrupted, I'll be you too. So now I'm preaching that all over America. My God, they got two shirt people. I mean, they say, good God, I like that. It's just a simple statement, but it has a revelation truth in it. And when, when Brother Copeland was praying for your healing, he was a two. He was getting to get, listen, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. So when you understand I'll be your two means presence and power, then you got to understand God just doesn't count heads when people pray and agree. He counts hearts. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Right? But some people think he's counting heads. No, he's counting hearts. Remember Brother Higgins said he laid uh, hands on empty heads. I think how he said that years and years ago. There are some people with dumb spirits and they're not possessed. <laughs> they're not possessed. They're just flat dumb. Just some of the most stupidest things you ever heard of in your life. I want God to give me a million dollars. Man, you can't even believe for five dollars. How are you going to get a million dollars? You got to start where you can believe. With something to start to work with you. See, prayer always depends upon your manner of life. People ask me all the time, how long you pray? I never tell them. Because to me, prayer is when you're asking God things. You're coming forward with a petition and supplication with thanksgiving. To me, that's prayer. I, I don't do that very often. I shocked you, didn't I? But I have conversations with God on a daily basis. I get up in the morning, I say this, hello, Jesus. He say, hi, Jesse. I say, what you doing? He say, watching you sleep. <laughs> then I've had God so many times say, what are we going to do today? Remember, we're his hands. And then I've had him wake me up and say, listen, I want you to be very aware there will be an opportunity that will come by very quickly. If you don't seize it, it will never come again. And it could be spiritual. It could be physical. It could be financial. It could be me walking in a parking lot at an individual and it coming and something happens. Be very aware. I never forget years and years ago. He suggested the devil going to try to kill you three times this year. I said, uh, uh. Well, what you going to do about it? <laughs> you know, when God says, am I going to try to kill you? It's going it's to pass. He said, no, what are you going to do about it? Because death and life's in the power of your tongue. Amen. I said, I'm going to live and not die. He said, be careful. Man, I've been shot at. People tried to knife me. They put 240 votes on my microphone. If I'd have touched that, it'd have thrown me, just killed me. I've had some crazy things happen. I'm still here but I knew it right before it happened. Been down in three airplane crashes. That's the most amazing thing. And I ain't, don't, and you don't want to believe for that. <laughs> it's amazing how people, I ain't never, I've heard people literally scream enough to break glass. And I ain't never heard anybody say Buddha or Mohammed. I've heard people just scream the name of Jesus. I have, and I, I never forget with me one time, Kathy, we were flying back from Dallas, going to New Orleans. You said, ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts. There's a lot of thunderstorms in the New Orleans area. This is a Delta flight. It's, it's in their records. I said, okay. Kathy was with me that time. Make a long story short. Man, I knew, because I've flown so much. Because you know, there's a lot of water around uh, New Orleans. I said, man. But there was some thunders. I mean, I mean, some bad black thunderous clouds, you know, and a wind shear. And that's something you don't want to get involved in if you're in an aircraft because it pushes you down. All of a sudden, I mean, I, we were 
10 minutes away from landing. I mean, I knew where I was. I could see, barely see down. They said, ladies and gentlemen, we got to turn around. We cannot land this jet. We're going to try to go back to Shreveport instead of going back to Dallas. I thought, man, alive, good God. And I, but I said, okay. All of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. I mean, it, I mean I'm talking turbulence that, uh, that, that makes you, that you speak in tongues. Because <laughs> it's rattling your jaw. I mean, bad turbulence. And then the pilot comes on, or the captain says, we were not, can't, we can't, it, it, this stuff is encircling us. We cannot make it back to Shreveport. We're going to have to land in Lake Charles. Now, this is several years ago. He said, the runway is not long enough for this jet. I'm going to burn the tires off. I thought to myself, well, here we go. <laughs> and the Lord said, didn't I tell you? I said, yeah. All of a sudden, they say lightning doesn't affect the plane because it's not grounded. <laughs> Yo, mama. <laughs> this was some powerful light. I'm sitting in the aisle seat bulkhead 10B. I heard this, oh, one of the loudest, boom, boom. I did this and all of a sudden water hitting me in my neck. And I look up and blew a hole in the fuselage this big. Right above me. People are screaming. The flight attendant goes, we're going to die. We're going to die. You don't like a Delta person telling you you're going to die. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? We're going to die. We're going to die. I unbuckled my seatbelt. And I grabbed her. And I shook her. Remember your training. <laughs> That's what I said. Remember your training. She goes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. she freaked. Everybody crying, screaming. I can't sit down again. I'm getting soaking wet. She said, you have to sit down. Well, I said, I'm almost to say to myself, well, if you wouldn't be going crazy, I'd have sat down. But I did. Boy, she buckled us up. I'm saying, when we hit, I mean, I'm saying, well, you can smell blue smoke, see, see blue smoke smell. I mean, burning the tires. And there's these ambulances and fire trucks waiting for you. Remember that, Kathy? Kathy was with me. I said, Kathy, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm with you, Jesse. You said you'd always take care of me. And I thought, man, well, if the rapture come down, how are we going to fit out of that little hole? Well, we're going through that hole there, but let them handle this thing. It was bad, son. And all of a sudden, the trucks, they're going down the runway behind us. You could see them. I mean, some are going in. I mean, and I, you could, and I thought, oh, Jesus, because I know once that, 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 that gear hits that mud, something's going to break, son, because they're not designed for that. We stopped about one foot from the end of the runway. Now, that was scary. And then the back door flew open. Here come a fireman with an axe in his hand. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? God, I'm not here running with an axe. I thought if he trips, somebody's going to be beheaded running like this with that axe. Now, the funny part was this. Captain, come on, said, I want to thank you for flying Delta in the future if you're funny. Am I telling the truth? Am I telling the truth, Captain? I, <laughs> Bill, it was, it was hair red. And I said, you know, Captain, we got to start believing for this airplane. Yeah, we need to believe with this airplane. I said, because I ain't going to never let a fireman with an ax get on it. <laughs> well, they shut everything down. I mean, people are mad and really glad they're on the ground and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to take three hours to get buses to come to Lake Charles, pick people up, try to get them, to, you know, all kinds of stuff. I'm standing. I said, well, I guess we're going to be here a long time. And the Delta captain said, I said, yes, sir. He said, I want to thank you for helping my flight attendant compose herself. I said, listen. I don't know why I said that. He said, I'm glad you did. He said, she should not have done that. I said, well, you know, it is pretty hair raising. I said, what was you doing? He said, hollering just like you were. <laughs> he said, I, I thought, God, he said, I was praying. I was doing everything. I, I knew the run, you cannot, we had to come down fast and we were coming down. He had, a, he had everything to think of, wind chill, you name it, man. Hail, every, I mean, this was bad stuff. And he says, come with me in. 
in there. So I went in there and I don't know how he did it, but he got us a car. And I mean, we left no more than what, 10 minutes after we walked in. Uh, it was like an FBO. Uh, and uh, people said, well, where are you going? I went home. <laughs> he said, I thank you for helping my flight attendant. They called him stu- stewardesses. In those days. And I thought I was her too. And God, I said, and he said, Reverend, I tell you what, I ble- he told me, he said, I believe more people prayed doing we going on that tax when we're going down that runway. I said, yeah, I should have took an offering. I bet I'd have got a bunch of back tides. <laughs> oh, Jesus. People give. Boy. <laughs> See, prayer always depends on your manner of life. I didn't say this, Jesus, I'm, no, I'm a no good person. I don't know. I just prayed. And I said, with a long life will God satisfy us and show us his salvation. I ain't satisfied. And Lord, I don't want my wife experiencing this ever again. And Kathy has it, I don't think. Well, one time in, over the water in Honolulu, I think it was a Maui. That's another one, Lord Jesus. So you know what? Within six months, we had an aircraft. It was a great day. And you know what God did? Kenneth and Gloria Copeland called me up and said, Jesse, this Kenneth. I said, hey, Brother Copeland. How fast you can get up here? I said, what? He said, how fast you can get up? It was 12 o'clock. I said, well, there's a Delta flight that flies out of New Orleans to Dallas at 105. He said, come now. I'll have someone pick you up from my ministry at the airport. And Kathy was in that office. I said, Kathy, we're going to Dallas. What fire? Shut up, woman. We're going to Dallas. Come on, we ain't got time. So she did. She ran, where are we going? I said, I don't know. Brother Combs said, be up there. He said, I think we found your plane. And I'm going to fly you up on my plane. Remember that? It was me and Gloria and Kenneth, uh, uh, Gloria and Kenneth, and me and Kenneth, and, and uh, da- Dar- Darren, the, uh, the uh, mechanic, Daryl. And sure enough, man, I walked in the hangar, and that was my first plane. He said, Jesse, I believe this is it. I said, I think so too. He said, Jess, Brother Copeland said, if you don't buy this, I'm going to buy it myself. I said, you ain't getting my plane. <laughs> he said, well, I'm setting myself in agreement with it. And brother, Within what, I don't know, an hour or so like that, talking to people, uh, we cut the deal and walked out. And it was a wonderful time. And that was the third time the devil tried to kill me. And I said, no more of this. I will determine my destiny from now on because I'm going to set myself in agreement with the word of God says, not some of the time, but all the time. And the Lord says, I'll be you too. And he always says, tell me what I said, Jesse. Go ahead, say, tell me what I said. And I love telling the Lord what he said. Let me close with this. When you understand this promise, what promise? That if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done to them from my father. Four things happen. Write it down. A new dawn lights up in your understanding. A new dawn. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like the sun coming, lights up in your understanding. A new warmth glows in your heart. You begin to feel, not only know it spiritually, but it's physically a warmth that will come into your heart. Number three, a new power is given to your will. A new power. I'm going to go over it again so you get it if I'm talking too fast. A new power is given to your will. And then number four, I love this. A new tenderness is given to your conscience. So let me say it again. Number one, a new dawn lights up in your understanding. A new warmth glows in your heart. A new power is given to your will. And a new tenderness is given to your conscience. And I want to close with this one story on the tenderness of conscience. 1980, me and Kathy decided to go buy some furniture. Watch this, a new tenderness is given to your conscience. So we knew this store had some nice furniture before we drove over there, walked in, to the store and the manager there said, sir, I said, me and my wife come to buy some bedroom furniture. He said, well, let me take you upstairs and introduce you to our sales representative. I said, okay. Walked up there. He said, uh, what is your name? I said, I'm Jess DePlance. You're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, well, Reverend DePlance, I'd like you to meet Raymond. And there was a little black man about this big. He says, hello, can I help you? I said, Raymond, we want to buy some furniture for our bedroom. 
And I, I said, y'all have such a wonderful selection. He said, Reverend, I'm going to show you exactly what to get. He said, today is a good day because things are on sale. And this man was phenomenal. I have never had an experience since like Raymond did when he sold us that furniture. So we were looking at this particular bedroom set over here. He said, now it looks good, but it's not very good. It won't last. He said, now this one over here. I said, well, we saw that it was Drexel Heritage. I don't know if you know what that is. He said, now this in here. I said, well, yeah, that's a lot more expensive. Well, today it's not. It's actually cheaper than this one. Because they just, they just called us, Drexel people, and put, said, put it on sale. He said, I promise you, you'll have this as long as you want. He said, I'll make sure if you decide to buy it, I will be with the delivery people to make sure they don't waddle out the screws and do all that kind of stuff and put it all together. I had never had a salesman do that. This man knew his business about furniture. It was such a delight. I said, Raymond, I, 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 I've, never, I've never been so happy in my life. He said, oh, well, I'm going to make sure that you're totally, completely pleased in your purchase. So we sat there and wrote the contract up, blah, blah, this and that, and did it. Showing up, man, we wouldn't want to, in those days they delivered it pretty fast. You know, it was like two days and they were there and Raymond was there. He said, now, he said, we have these men. You want to move it around as many times as you want so you, so you can see different things. I mean, this, it, it just don't get no better than this. So we bought it, found it. He says, you ever need my assistance anymore? You know, I'm at the store. We can help it. We said, thank you. It was one of the most pleasant uh, contractual agreements that we ever did in our life. I mean, and the furniture was just beautiful, nice. It was a rice bed. You know what a rice bed is and all that kind of stuff? You know, well, anyway, to make a long story short, about three and a half, four years later, me and Kathy decided we got to get some more furniture. Not change that one, just we got to buy some other things. I said, Kathy, I wonder if that guy, Raymond, is still working at that store. Watch this, a new tenderness is given to your conscience. So we went to the store, different manager. I said, hello, I'm Reverend Jesse DePlanche. Yes, sir, can I help you? I said, uh, we want to buy some, uh, we want to buy two or three um, sets of furniture here. Oh, good, thank you. I said, uh, is Raymond still working here? He goes, <coughs> <coughs> So I waited for him to clear his throat. I thought something was wrong with him, you know, I, I didn't know. I said, maybe you didn't understand. I said, uh, we had such a most delightful experience with a young man named Raymond when we bought. I said, does he still work here? <coughs> <coughs> I thought, what's wrong with this guy? You know? He said, well, let me take you upstairs. He didn't answer the question. So up the same escalators we went. Now I know exactly what Raymond looked like because it was such a pleasant experience. So he says, uh, Raymond is no longer here, but we have a person named Desiree. Desiree. So Desiree turned around and looked just like Raymond <laughs> with the hair flipped like this. <laughs> so I look at Kathy, she look at me, she goes, Reverend, Reverend, it's so wonderful to see you. Oh, Reverend. I wanted to say, what happened, Raymond? What? He says, my name is now Desiree and I'm a woman. I've always felt like a woman. I've always, you know, I feel like a woman. I wanted to tell him, I feel like Hercules. Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm doing. But the reason why I ain't Hercules, I ain't got the equipment. <laughs> now, I don't want to see this. I'm not interested in it. I'm trying to buy some furniture. Oh, Reverend, it's so wonderful to see you. Okay, uh, Desiree's your name? Yes, hair flipped up, false eyelashes, lipstick. Sounds like today, don't it? <laughs> Sounds like today, don't it? I look at Kathy and she said, you on your own, just a baby. Mm -mm. I said, well, I said, R -R -R Desiree, let me show you what you need. <laughs> so I thought maybe I'd do a little lean. Okay, baby. <laughs> I thought, oh, gee. 
I ain't coming for this. I'm just trying to get some furniture, you understand? Know <laughs> Desiree is just as good as Raymond. Desiree knows furniture. Remember, a new tenderness is given to your conscience. Shows us the pieces. I'm telling you what, know that business like the back of your hand. This person was amazing. And I just didn't know what to call. You said Desiree, right? Yes. I told Kathy, I'm having a hard time uh, concentrating on the furniture. She says, you, do, you can pick the furniture. I'm just going to stay here and watch you. He says, let me have your hand. <laughs> Let me, I'll show you where we're going. Oh, okay, here's a preacher walking with Desiree. <laughs> Lord Jesus. I don't know what to do, but I ain't going there for that. I'm going to buy furniture. Had the most pleasant experience in terms of the furniture. I will go to your house. I said, it's okay. I said, that's okay. You've done so well, we can figure this ourselves. Oh, no, really, Reverend, I just want to be a blessing to you. I said, okay, Desiree, I just appreciate that. Then I started acting like that crazy manager. <laughs> I, I, I'm freaking out here, you understand? When you're raising a man's man's world, Desiree don't fit. So we're writing up the contra contractual agreement, stuff like that. And I said, uh, uh, how, how you doing there, Desiree? I mean, how did this all happen? Huckleys, Huckleys, Huckleys. And then Desiree started crying. Oh, Reverend, I'm so confused. I've always felt like a woman. And I, I, I am a woman. I said to myself, you the ugliest woman I've ever saw in my life. How do you say? Cause you look, you look better at Raymond than you do at Desiree. That's all I can say. But I'm talking perfect in terms of that furniture. Then the ministry kicks in. And the Lord said, appeal to the sensibilities. Appeal to the sensibilities. Why don't you talk to Desiree? <laughs> Reverend, I just don't know what to do. I'm so confused. I said, well, what's the problem, Desiree? I wanted to say, you think you're a woman? If you want to know, check your equipment. It tell you what you are. <laughs> but I don't feel, I don't feel like Hercules. <laughs> Why? Well, you mean if I do it, <laughs> you got to have the equipment. You understand? She said, well, I tell you, I'm so dis disappointed in this store. I said, you are. They won't let me use the woman's bathroom. It's not right, because I am a woman. Rub it up, I'm a woman. I go, oh, okay there, Desiree. <laughs> so you want to use the woman's bathroom? Yeah, and the employees are just having fits about this. This is years ago. The Lord said, appeal to, to the sensibilities. I looked at Desiree. I said, Desiree, let me just say this. When you was Raymond, we never forgot you. And we will never forget this. <laughs> I said, you made our shopping experience one of the greatest pleasures I think I've ever had when I went to buy anything. You know, you're so competent in your work ethic. Thank you, Rep. Just thank you. I said, let me ask you a question. If they would let you go in that woman's bathroom, would you ever touch a child? Reverend, I would never do that. Or maybe some, I guess, no, I, I'm not that kind of person. I said, Desiree, if you push this, you're going to open up a door for sexual predators to get in a place they should not be in. I said, I don't think you're that kind of person. She said, I have to say she, she said, I know I would never do that. It would be so wrong. I, I, and you know, most transgender people are not like that. They just confused. They're just trying to find themselves. They don't know who they are. They're all messed up. 
devil's done everything he could to destroy these people. I said, and if you open that door, I said, somebody could be hurt. Maybe not, not, not by you. I said, but there's some people, they'll do anything to get in there. And I saw when it hit. You know, Reverend, you're right. I never thought of that. You know, I'm going to withdraw my request. Because I, 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 I would never want anyone hurt. You know, that's really true. I said, yes, it is. I said, Desiree, I'm going to pray for you. The Lord said, hold the hand. Both of them. Okay. I felt funny, people. I'm not going to lie. I felt funny. But you're not moved by your feeling. You're moved by your faith. And I prayed for Desiree. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, help Desiree find herself by finding you. Because if Desiree finds you, I didn't say this, Raymond going to show up. <laughs> I said, and bless this person because they've been such a wonderful blessing to me and Kathy. In Jesus name, pray. I mean, they didn't fall in the squad. Now, you know, that's many years ago. And I walked out of there. I could have hurt Desiree terribly. I could have eat her, heat her, her, he, she, whatever you want. Her lunch, his lunch. But I decided to let, I decided to become a two with God to help someone who desperately needs help. Amen. Not that I'm better in any way, shape or form. Now, I don't know if Desiree or Raymond is still living today. That's been so many years ago. Do you know that bedroom set? I still have it. And Happy Caldwell and Jeannie Caldwell slept in at my house. We call it the English room. And every time I walk in there, I think about that. I say, oh, Lord, help that person. Because you see, if you rejoice in things like that, something's wrong. And I close with this statement. Consulting together brings intelligence and agreement get God's attention. See, I can consult it with the Lord how I'm going to handle this. So when those things come up, and they do come up now quite a bit because the world's changed so much, I appeal to the sensibilities of that person. Because the minute you say, we hate the sin and love the sinner, you, you done messed up there. That may be true in one sense, but you got to understand, they're not, they're not under God's law because they don't even believe in God's law. And you're trying to make them understand a spiritual concept when the Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of God because they're foolishness unto him and neither can he know them because they spiritually discern. Go, go find that scripture. You can put that in, in the notes. So I just appeal to their sensibilities. I let my light shine, Bill. Now, am I comfortable around that kind of stuff? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm not. But you know what? They don't know it. And I just pray, God help me. So I see when an alcoholic, I pray, God help. I see a drug addict, I pray, God help. I see someone struggling financially, I pray, God help. You know, I ain't telling everybody what's wrong. I'm just going to preach what's right. And if I preach another right, it will change what's wrong. Not some of the time, but all the time. Did you enjoy it tonight? I'll be you too. I'll be you too. You don't have to look. You don't have to look any further. I'll be you too. But if you can get your whole church to become twos, if you can get everybody, it's amazing what will happen.